I want you to imagine with me, if you will, a flight across the Atlantic, DFW to London Heathrow, a modern 777 Boeing aircraft in perfect condition. The weather is ideal, hardly a cloud in the sky. You've got a very well-trained flight crew, a captain, first officer, sitting in the third chair, another experienced person. Uh, on board this flight as well, there, there are a lot of people, 380 people. There's among them a heart surgeon. There is an accountant. There is an auto mechanic. Um, but here's the difference. Here's the weird thing about this flight. This is kind of the Twilight Zone element here. People are not sitting in the right chairs. Uh, the experienced aviators, the captain and his flight crew, they're sitting back in economy class. And sitting at the controls of this flight, you've got the surgeon, the accountant, and the mechanic. How do you think that's going to go? Or better yet, let me ask you this. If the airline offered you a free first class ticket for this flight, would you get on this plane knowing he, who's going to be in charge of takeoff and getting you from point A to point B and landing that plane? No. We want the right people in the right chairs when it comes to things that really matter and that's really what we're talking about these days as we work on this elder selection process. We want the right people in the right chairs. You know, it doesn't matter at all if that heart surgeon is the best surgeon in the world or that mechanic knows how to work on any make and model and that accountant is an expert on taxes and a gifted number cruncher. It, those things don't matter when it comes to them trying to fly an airplane, right? And so at Preston Crest, we want to get the right people in the right chairs. When it comes to the health and vitality of this church and really our, our future over the next five to ten years, I can think of nothing that matters more than getting the right people in those chairs. God has prepared those people as we call out additional elders, and we are seeking really over the next few months, we are seeking to find out who those individuals are. Those men and their wives will be setting the tone at this church and the direction of this church for the next few years. So we're just really praying, as Phil mentioned uh, earlier, we're just praying, we're on our knees, we're asking God to put the right people in those roles, and we want you to join us in that. And that means add that into your prayers every day. It means circle on the calendar September the 4th, the day of prayer and fasting. Wherever you are, at school or work or on vacation in Cancun, wherever you are, pray on that day. And maybe if you're on vacation, don't fast. Okay, but the rest of us, we want to fast. We just really want to seek the Lord on this because... It doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, I don't know who these people are going to be. You don't know who these people are going to be. God does, and we want him to reveal that to us. And that's what it's all about for the next few weeks and even months here. Now, let me say this. I don't think this is going to surprise you. You know, Jesus is the chief shepherd, uh, according to 1 Peter chapter 5. And Jesus Christ, like he has very different ideas about leadership than the culture, right? I mean, Jesus and the culture differ quite a bit. Like, for Jesus, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can look at who he chose to be uh, his apostles and leaders in his church. It doesn't matter whether you are rich, whether you are poor, whether you are brilliant, or whether you are beautiful. What matters when we think about leadership, what is their relationship to God how do they feel about the church of Jesus, the body of Christ, and will they lead like Jesus? All right. So we're looking for second chair people. Second chair people are people who put themselves second, second to the Lord, second to the people who they care about and are serving. So around us today, we do see a very different style of leadership in a lot of places, whether it's uh, prima donna athletes or power hungry executives and politicians we see a very different model of what the culture thinks about when you say the word leader and i was thinking this week who could i choose that that might exemplify that 
kind of worldly leadership. And I thought about a guy from the Old Testament named Absalom. Absalom was one of David's sons. So he was a prince of Israel. He was in line to potentially be king someday. And he had the looks of a leader, to be honest. Um, In fact, I would say, if I were going to describe for you, you don't know who Absalom is, I would say he was kind of a mashup of Kim, of like half Kim Kardashian and half Kim Kim Jong-un, all right? You've got the looks of the first and like the ruthlessness of the second. That is Absalom in the Old Testament. He uh, looked like a lot of people you see in leadership roles today. He was attractive. He was charismatic. He was wealthy. He was well-connected. And he had a bit of a God complex, right? Um, And also, Absalom wanted more than anything else to be leader. Now, let me say this. It's not a bad thing to want to lead. I mean, I think most leaders want to lead. They're called to that, if you will. In fact, when Paul is talking to Timothy about calling out elders, calling out shepherds, uh, he does talk about the desire to be an elder not being a bad thing. So it's not wrong to want to lead. But let me ask you this. Absalom flying the plane? Like, you don't want that. You don't want Absalom flying. It would have been a catastrophe for Israel uh, because he was not a second chair person. He wasn't a servant of God. He wasn't a servant of the people. He was a servant of Absalom, okay? But again, he did look the part. So 2 Samuel chapter 14. Now in all Israel, try to imagine this guy. In all Israel, there was No one so much to be praised for his handsome appearance as Absalom. From the sole of his foot to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. Recently, uh, archaeologists and scholars have have worked up what they believe Absalom, Absalom looked like. And here are the results of their findings. There you have him. Absalom looked a little bit like that. Blue steel, right? Um, He was Prince Zoolander. I mean, he was a ridiculously good-looking man. And he had a huge ego. 2 Samuel 18, 18. During his lifetime, speaking of this ego, during his lifetime, Absalom had taken a pillar and erected it in the King's Valley as a monument to himself. For he thought, I have no son to carry on the memory of my name. He named the pillar after himself. And to this day, it is called Absalom's Monument. Incredible, right? I mean, this guy is looking at the, the, the like Valley of the Kings and he's thinking, something's missing here. Ah, it, what's missing is a monument to me, right? I need my face on Mount Rushmore. So he was driven by unbridled ambition. And we see a lot of that these days. Our culture, many in leadership positions are driven by unbridled personal ambition. And he would stop at nothing to claim that. And as we see in the next text we're going to read, he was pretty skilled at this. Like, like he could run a modern American election campaign. He would be good at doing that. Check this out. 2 Samuel 15. In the course of time, Absalom pres- provided for himself a chariot and horses and 50 men to run in front of him. Um, and then it says he would get up early and stand by the side of the road leading to the city gate. And whenever anyone came with a complaint to be placed before the king for a decision, Absalom would call out and say, What town are you from? He would answer, Your servant is from one of the t- tribes of Israel. Then Absalom would say to him, Look, your claims, doesn't matter what those claims are, he would say, Your claims are valid and proper, but there is no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, If only I were boss. If I, only I were appointed judge of the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case would come to me and I would see that he gets justice. 
Also, this part is so clever. Whenever anyone approached him to bow down before him, Absalom was like, no, 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 you're not bowing down before me. Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice. And so he stole the hearts of the men of Israel, probably the ladies too, okay? stole the hearts of the people of Israel. So Absalom represents how people often imagine modern leaders. He was dashing, he was driven. He was dashing, he was driven. And he had all of this going for him and it enabled him to attract a rather large following. Long story short, he was able to pull off essentially a coup and kick his father off the throne, but he was only able to do this for a very short time with some pretty disastrous consequences. I mean, lives were lost in the ego-driven civil war that followed. The family of David was kind of divided. The nation was divided, and he himself lost his life. Uh, Check this out, though. Thinking about this is as, as being something that's not all that uncommon, even Jesus in the leaders Jesus selected for his ministry, the apostles, even he dealt with, the, to a lesser extent, these kind of egos and ambitions. Mark chapter 10, we've got a story about this. They are on the road outside of Jericho somewhere, and these two brothers who are apostles, their names are James and John, and we overhear them plotting, scheming, how can we get the key leadership roles in the kingdom? How can we be appointed to the little thrones to the left and right of the big throne of Jesus. That's what they were thinking about. And and as you might expect, when the other apostles got wind of this scheming, they were rather angry with James and John, probably because they hadn't thought of it first. Um, Jesus gathers them all around and says, children, or I mean, no, not children. He says, guys, get together. I got to talk to you about this. This is not good. Mark chapter 10, Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers, leaders of the Gentiles, lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be last, must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came... Not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus is looking for second chair leaders. He's looking for people who put themselves second. And he flips the script on how many times the world evaluates leaders. Because the world says the greatest leader is the one with the greatest number of servants. The greatest number of followers. And Jesus says, no, the greatest leader is the one who serves the most people. Right? So a very different way of thinking about leadership. Well, one of the guys listening to Jesus in Mark chapter 10 is someone I'm sure you've heard of, Peter, Simon Peter, who was an apostle and who in time would actually become a local church elder. And he wrote some advice to other elders around Turkey, around Asia Minor, about how to, how to do their job, how to, how to be good elders. And we'll get to that in just a moment in 1 Peter chapter 5. But first, I want to do a little bit of Greek with you this morning. Because Peter is going to use three words in this passage. Poimen, episkopos, and presbyteros. And these three Greek words are the words you're going to see Paul use when he talks about elders in Titus and 1 Timothy. These are the words. You can use them interchangeably when you think about this office, this role, this function of elder in the church. Okay, so I've got these on your outline this morning. The first word is poimen, which is shepherd. It is the Greek word 
for a shepherd. Sometimes you could translate that as a pastor or a shepherd. And it points to that leadership function of an individual who is in a flock and noticing the needs of those members of the flock and is making sure that those needs are cared for. That's poimen. The second word that we're going to see today is presbuteros, which you can translate as elder or ancient one. Or if you're Presbyterian, you have presbyters in your church. And this points to the influence that somebody wields, influence, based on their life experiences, on their wisdom, on their knowledge. They just draw people to them because they are such a wealth of counsel and advice and, and good influence. And then finally, we have episkopos, which is translated from Greek into bishop or elder or overseer, okay? Episkopos, uh, which points to the role of, of shaping the direction of a church, of the congregation, according to the will of Jesus, making sure that, you know, true north, it, that they're locked on to what the Lord has for them, overseeing the ministry and the direction of the church. Now, Peter is going to use those words in the text we're about to read. Uh, Paul is going to use those words when he writes to, to Titus in Crete and Timothy in Ephesus. So here we go in 1 Peter 5. Peter says, So I exhort the elders, the presbyteros, I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder, Peter is an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd, you know, poimen, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, episkopos, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples, influence, right? Examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, Jesus, the poimen, when he appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, one little technical observation I would make here. There are essentially three New Testament passages that describe elders or pastors or shepherds, right? We've got 1 Timothy chapter 3, we've got Titus chapter 1, and we've got this passage, 1 Peter chapter 5. What I want you to notice, this is interesting, you can study this at home this week, each of those descriptions is a little bit different, right? No two of them are exactly the same. That means uh, the folks in Crete, uh, uh, which Titus, who he was working with, they got one list. Okay, the people in Ephesus uh, with Timothy got a slightly different list. Uh, these people in Asia Minor, Turkey, got a little bit of a different list from Peter. Each description is a little bit different. Um, so since we don't have a one size fits all kind of checklist for shepherds or elders, I think it's just a good reminder, we are not looking for the perfect person, right? We are looking for a certain kind of person, a second chair kind of person. Now, I get to work with outstanding shepherds here at Preston Crest, and I've worked with other eldership shepherding groups in different places, even in Brazil, and I can tell you, I've worked with a lot of great people. I have never seen a perfect elder, okay? And I have never worked with two elders who were the same, who thought the same about everything, who were the same personality. I have never seen any two men who were exactly alike. So let me ask you, why would Paul give one set of instructions to Crete, give a slightly different set of instructions about elders to Ephesus, and Peter gives another to the group in Asia Minor? Well, it's really pretty obvious when you think about it. Uh, each of those congregations was in different circumstances, right? Each of those groups would have had a, a, a different pool of potential elders. Uh, and each of them was, was in a different city with different challenges unique to that city. So I say that to say, uh, this is pretty obvious, I think, 
But what we are looking for here over the next few months, we are digging into Scripture to find those men that God has for us here at Preston Crest, Dallas, Texas, 2019. That is our mission. Um, so we're looking for those that type of person here. And Peter's counsel helps us to really distinguish between uh, first chair or me first leaders and second chair or servant leaders, right? In that text, I've got some stuff on your outline this morning. Like first off, we find out that these first chair me first leaders, they are about personal promotion, you know, uh, ambition. Uh, and he talks about, you know, uh, shameful gain, verse 2, whereas your second chair leader is about promoting the common good. Or as Peter says there in verse 2, shepherding the flock. They're thinking about the group. They're thinking about the needs of those around them. Um, first chair leaders are all about leading from above. Peter's word is domineering. They're about controlling. I'm in charge. Second chair leaders do not lead from above. Peter says they lead from among. In fact, that phrase there in verse 2, it is the flock that is what? The flock that is among you. They're with the people, not above the people. Uh, first chair leaders, of course, are prideful. Second chair leaders are humble, Peter says. Um, first chair leaders can feel like it's this obligation that they're doing certain things unwillingly. Second chair leaders are doing it eagerly. Um, they're shepherding the flock willingly. So essentially, I mean, there are a lot of things you could say about this, but Peter basically says the elder who is determined to run the church is going to ruin the church. You do not want that person who thinks their job is to run everything. You want the shepherd. You want the second chair leader. Peter tells us the worst kind of spiritual leader is the one who is controlling and domineering. That is not the way Jesus led people. So most people, right, in our culture, they think the leader is the one who is in charge. For the chief shepherd, for Jesus, leadership is not about power. It is about service. Um, so back to the people on the airplane. <laughs> you, <laughs> you want the aviators in the cockpit. You want the aviators sitting at the controls. Now, if you need to have a double bypass surgery, you want the heart surgeon. If you've got an issue with your transmission, you want the mechanic. If you need someone to do your taxes, you want the accountant. But a thriving church gets the right people in the right chairs. Okay? Um, so to be clear, we welcome broken sinners here at Preston Crest. We welcome Jameses and Johns and Absaloms. We welcome people who are a little bit narcissistic, people who are a little bit selfish, people who are a little bit prideful, because this is a church for sinners that want to grow in the image of Jesus, those who've been redeemed by the blood of Christ and are trying to grow. So we welcome those people. We're all on a journey to grow and be better disciples, but we don't want Absalom in the leadership chair. We don't want Absalom to be an elder. So at Preston Crest, we want to get the right people in the right chairs. And for our shepherds, we want Jesus-loving men who care about His flock, His church, who lead by influence, not by coercion. We need people who lead from among the flock, not above the flock, and we need men who serve not because they have to, but because it is second nature to them to serve. And we have been so blessed here over the years with a lot of terrific elders and elders' wives, but it is time to get them some help. It is time to call out some additional elders here at Preston Crest. And let me just say, our future is bright as a church if we get the right people in the right seats. You get the shepherds shepherding. You get servant leaders leading. Teachers are teaching encouraging 
Encouragers are encouraging. Organizers are organizing. You want to get the right people in the right places. And this is an important moment for us uh, because there are, look, there are a lot of things that we can mess up as a church, and it's really not that big of a deal, right? I mean, we could choose the wrong color of carpet for the auditorium or the wrong, wrong type of projector to shoot on the wall. We can make a lot of mistakes here. You don't want to make the mistake of getting the wrong people in the cockpit, of getting the wrong people in those leadership roles, right? Um, so let's, let's just let's finish our morning here by, by talking to, to the chief shepherd about this. If you would do that with me, that's bow. Let's talk to Jesus about this. Lord... This is your church. We are a church of Christ. We belong to you, Lord. And this process that we're using, it's imperfect, I'm sure, in different ways, but it's the, it's the best we can come up with. And so we just ask that you make it yours, not ours. We ask that, you know, whatever names that we come up with that those are the ones that you have already come up with. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will bless us during this season with wisdom, that you will bless us with the unity of the Spirit as we move forward in calling out additional shepherds. Chief Shepherd Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. This morning, let me ask you, if it's time to give your life to Jesus, to, to move under His care to become part of his flock you can do that today expressing your faith in jesus your decision to make him your lord and savior you can be baptized in the name of jesus right here right now maybe you just need to talk to him he is a good shepherd he is interested in the needs and the concerns of his flock. And, and as we gather, whether it's just in groups, you with your connection class this morning, or maybe somebody sitting next to you, or you come pray with me, or one of our elders here, Preston Crest, we are bringing those needs and issues and even celebrations and victories. We're bringing those to the feet of our good shepherd, Jesus. Let's do that now as we stand together and respond to him.